Alrighty, hey guys, lecture six seven. Okay, um, so the the textbook takes a bit of a change here, and this always happens in, in consciousness chapters. We we talk about sort of consciousness and attention and all the stuff we've been doing so far, which I would like you to kind of think about. I guess the cognitive psychology's perspective on us when we are awake and alert. Right. So let's just stop there for a moment and say, you know, the notion of that diagram I've shown you so many times is that when we are awake and alert and interacting with the world, um, we have a bunch of unconscious habits that are sometimes triggered by the world and that govern our behaviors. Uh, and we also are consciously making decisions about things we want to do, things that align with our goals, typically. Uh, and sometimes we consciously take control of our actions. So while we're awake and alert and while we're interacting with our world, um, there are both unconscious processes and conscious processes going on. Um, and that is sort of the view of awake existence, awake, normal existence. Okay. Part of that is what that awake, normal existence feels like the subjective state, you know, what, what, what it feels like to be us at that time. And when we get to altered states of consciousness, what we're really kind of saying now is, you know, there's times when that little balance I've told you about, about the normal waking state gets changed, gets, gets, um, something um, has has a real significant effect on the way we experience the world. Um, and typically when people are talking about these altered states of consciousness in intro psych chapters, there's sort of three um, levels at which we talk about it quite often. We'll talk about sleep, and the textbook certainly does that. And now let me skip. We often talk about drugs and how they can alter our sense of consciousness. Uh, and typically, a chapter talks about hypnosis. This one didn't. Um, this one skipped hypnosis. I didn't like that. <laughs> um, when I learned about hypnosis in my intro psych class, it was a significant part of me really becoming interested in psychology. I'm going to tell you that story more when we when we talk about the hypnosis thing. But I think I think the state of hypnosis is is worth considering and is in fact a good way to kind of wrap up the chapter, a good kind of end to my lectures at least in this chapter. So I am going to talk about hypnosis. I will not talk about the drug stuff. You know, you guys either are no people who use various drugs or you are people who use various drugs. At, at any rate, humans are always just sort of fascinated by the, the effect that drugs can have on us. Uh, we are biochemical machines, right? That's as you know, axons are all about uh, chemical interactions. And so we shouldn't be surprised at all that ingesting chemicals or having them somehow enter our body can change the way the machine works. Uh, and so that section will tell you about about some of those drugs. And it's, that's very interesting. I think it's engaging enough so that you can just read that and, and you'll be fine. I don't think you need me to kind of pipe in so much. Uh, plus, it doesn't really, yeah, uh, the, the narrative I've been telling, it's not uh, like drugs is kind of like you take this one, this happens, take this one, this happens. Um, it, it's, a, it's a little more random, let's say. Uh, but I would like to talk about sleep. And in fact, I'm going to talk about dreams for a while. So I'll have a lecture now on sleep a lecture on dreams, and then I'll finish with a lecture on hypnosis. And that'll be the, the last lectures in, in this chapter. Okay, this one might be a little long, I don't expect the next two to be long. Okay, so let's jump into sleep, then. Okay, one of the things I, I'm kind of using sleep as an excuse here, uh, to, to do something that I always like to do, which is to um, warn you guys about the dangerous power of evolution theory. Wow, that sounds kind of weird. One of the ways we measure theories, you guys have been talking about theories quite, or you guys have been thinking about theories. And, and what we've said about theories is, hey, with a theory, you can often get to a hypothesis, which is a prediction you can derive from the theory. And then that prediction turns out to be true or not. Um, and that allows you to test the theory, right, by testing its predictions. There are some theories that are so strong, they can account for almost anything, you know, by talking about the theory in a different way. And in fact, Freud's theories um, that have been coming and going and will continue to come and go in this section are often found as guilty of this, that there is no pattern of data 
that Freud couldn't provide an explanation for within his theory, that his theory is so complex and multifaceted that he can describe almost any outcome, and therefore there is no prediction that would ever falsify. There's no pattern of data that would show him to be wrong. We in the science like falsifiable theories. Okay. We also like evolution theory. But it turns out evolution theory is often also very flexible. Uh, and, and I want to use this as an account as a sort of warning. Why do scientists like evolution theory? Um, to a large extent, when the question came up, how did life take such all of its varied forms? Evolution theory provides a nice um, framework with very few assumptions that can kind of explain a process that could make that happen. Uh, and so it's a very clear process. And in fact, we can do experiments to show that parts of evolution theory where you could um, you could falsify it. Uh, ultimately, when you get into the data, you realize that sometimes the predictions of evolution theory hold up quite well. So there are some studies that have directly uh, tested predictions. There are people out there trying to falsify it, um, but it turns out it's pretty powerful too. And so I always think just because someone can provide you with an evolutionary story to something, that shouldn't necessarily impress you because you can do a lot of evolutionary stories and sometimes you can do different stories for the same phenomenon. And so let me just kind of bring this up with sleep. Um, I was really interested in sleep one year when we taught this and we actually brought in a guest speaker from uh, Toronto Western Hospital who is uh, an expert at the sleep lab there uh, to talk to us about sleep. And he, one of the questions that came up is, well, why? Why do we sleep? Uh, and, and it turns out there's two quite different stories, both evolutionary in origin. So let me just tell you the stories and then let's come back to this issue. So, so one notion um, is this, that you know, in our caveman days, and, and you guys know now our sensory systems, we're really, we really bias ourselves towards using our eyes, using vision as our primary sense. And of course, we evolved in a world where it was only light and bright for so many hours a day. And once it gets dark, all we have then are our rods and we can see a little bit, but we can't see nearly as good, not nearly as much detail, no color. Um, and, and so we become pretty um, uh, weak. So, so to speak, at night, we don't want to be out at night in a world full of predators, right? And so one theory is that sleep is not important at all. It's, it's really just an energy conservation mode. If we cannot be out there hunting and gathering, if we cannot be getting food and nutrients to support ourselves, um, then we should then we should conserve energy during those periods. Uh, and so one claim is we've started sleeping eight hours a day simply as a low energy consumption mode. Um, with very little activity and very little whatever, we're drawing very little resources from our body. Uh, and so we save you know, our active time uh, to be those times when we can actually recover some of the resources we're burning by being active. So by that theory, sleep is just a holding pattern. There's nothing all that important about it. Now, another theory says, goes like this. We human beings sleep about eight hours a day. That's a third of our lives. The textbook kind of describes it this way. Think of what we could do with that third if we weren't asleep. You know, think of all the extra things we could do in life if we didn't wait. And not only are we asleep and not doing anything useful, we are um, pathetic. <laughs> <laughs> the right animal with the right mouth who bit us in the right place could kill us. An animal probably, you know, 200 times lighter than we are could kill us in our sleep. A squirrel could probably take us down if that squirrel knew where to bite or a rabbit or even a good old rat uh, could probably take us down while we're asleep because we're defenseless. And so one theory says, hey, okay, if we're going to spend a third of our day doing nothing and being defenseless, there's got to be a good reason for that. There's, there's no way we would evolve to do that unless there was some real benefit that came with sleep. Um, and so therefore, sleep must be critically important to us in some way. All right. 
two sort of evolutionary theories. One says sleep is just an energy saving mode. It's not all that important at all. The other one says it's critically important. It must be, or we would have evolved not to do it by now um, because it leaves us so open to danger and such. Again, just an example of how, you know, with an evolutionary theory, depending on what you focus on, you can tell stories that explain something. Um, it's, it's good. That the, the, these are good places to start, but that's where we need experiments and such to really get to the reality of what's going on. And evolution theory is just not, not good enough. So let's jump into some experiments. And, and I want to I'll largely follow the textbook in this section for a little bit and then I'll bounce off it. But but I just want to make sure some of these things are clear um, and add my own spin to it, of course. So part of the spin I want to add here is as we go into the stages of sleep, I want you to think also about the fact that, you know, we've talked about psychology being a challenging science because you often cannot directly measure what you want to study. But one of the interesting things about psychology is we get new toys every now and then. We get new tools, and these new tools allow us to um, see things and measure things that we couldn't measure before. And sometimes they open up whole new areas of research and whole new areas of study. Um, and that's certainly the case with sleep. The new toy was something called EEG, electroencephalogram. And you see somebody here with a with what we call a cap, an EEG cap on. They're like swim caps. You can put on your head and you have all these electrodes. Now we call them electrodes, but you know what electrodes really are? They're kind of microphones, little tiny microphones. And, and what we're measuring here, we say it's the electrical activity in the brain. We're actually listening to the brain. Uh, and we're hearing a little bit of shh static um, that's coming from the brain. And that static is because it's the brain's an electrical um, beast, right? A, an electrochemical thing. And there's a bunch of electrical interactions going on as the brain works. And we can listen to that. And we can listen to that at various spots around your skull and start to get an idea of what is going on in the brain. Now, the, the study of EEG has come a long way. In fact, one whole area of psychology now is all about the data mining that you can, you know, th these things are getting a whole bunch of information. Can we richly mine that data to, to answer you know, questions that we that we couldn't answer without those analyses? Um, there's a lot of psychologists just worrying about how to take all this data from these various brain imaging devices, fMRIs, MRIs, EEGs, et cetera, and, and really milk it, you know, really mine that data for all it's worth. Uh, but in the early days of EEG, it, it was not like that. Uh, in the early days of EEG, it was used just to sort of measure the activity level of the brain. And I'll show you this um, graph from the textbook now. Let's just kind of look at the, at the top part, first of all. Uh, and one of the things they found is you could see changes in this electrical activity as a function of various things. So again, if we stay on the top, these are both while we're awake. But if we're awake and we're kind of chill, we're just relaxing, we see a pattern of this uh, electrical activity called alpha waves. So I, I have to slow down a little bit here. There's two things, well, three things. We often talk about three things. Let me say three things with respect to, to these sorts of wave patterns. One is we talk about the amplitude. How big are the waves uh, in, on average? The other one that we talk about is the frequency. How tightly packed are are the waves. And you see, for example, this is more tightly packed than this, as an example, which is even more tightly packed than this. We'll come to all these. Um, but the third one is how regular and specifically, are there any um, systematic irregularities? And we'll come to those down here, various systematic irregularities that you see a certain pattern, but every now and then you see these, these other things that come now and then. Okay. And so if we look at relaxed wakefulness, what we tend to see is a high frequency, so they're bunched in, medium amplitude, so they're, they're, they're fairly big waves, and, and a lot of symmetry to the waves. We don't see anything too weird in the waves. Now, if you take this person that's relaxed and awake, and you see this sort of uh, energy coming from the electrodes, um, but now you give them a task, something that requires them to think and work through. So I say now, it says here alert, um, but what it really means is more busy, cognitively busy. So that the person isn't just relaxing, they're actually thinking something through. And as we start to do that, 
that, what we see is that the amplitude of the wave gets smaller. Okay, we don't have as over here it's bigger, over here it's smaller. The frequency is sort of similar and we still don't see anything um, all that odd. It's still a pretty regular wave, um, but the whole, as, as we start thinking about something, that wavelength, uh, sorry, oh, that amplitude gets smaller. I have to be careful with my word, words. Okay, so this is one of the first things people notice and they're like, oh, the brain kind of gets a little quiet literally when it's thinking to some extent. It, it at least doesn't have as much of a big, it's not really quiet, but it doesn't have as much of the big amplitude stuff. Interesting. And then somebody at some point said, well, what happens if you um, put electrodes on someone when they go to sleep? And it turned out that this revealed something to us that, that many of us just did not know. And that is that there seemed to be some predictable stages of sleep that we go through. We kind of knew a little bit about REM and dreams. I'll come back to that. Um, but this distinction was, was, was quite different. And so let me walk you through this. The idea here is we tend to sleep in these 45 minute cycles, not strictly as I'll show you, but for now, let's just think about it as a 45 minute cycle where we go through these regular steps. Stage one starts by, if you compare it to this, you see, um, first of all, that the, the frequency gets bigger, right? We're not as tightly packed anymore. We're starting to see these waves um, become slower frequency and higher yet, higher amplitude even than the restful ones. So we're getting bigger waves that are further apart. Uh, and every now and then we see these little periods of, of especially uh, high amplitude waves here um, that we call theta waves. So in stage one, this is when you're just going to bed and you're starting to relax. And in fact, if we woke you up during stage one while this was happening, you'd probably say you weren't asleep yet. You, you just feel like you're starting to drift. And if we woke you up, you'd say, oh, man, I was just starting to get to sleep. Why'd you do that? Don't do that, please, um, et cetera. Okay, that's the early stages. Now, if you if we let you sleep a little longer, we still see a lot of that same pattern, but we start to see these things. And this is what really distinguishes stage two. We start to see these little sleep spindles and these little so-called K complexes, these big, big amplitude little dip thing every now and then. And this seems to be just as you're really falling asleep. This is you transitioning between wakefulness and, and true sleep. Okay, and then true sleep hits in stage three or slow wave sleep. Uh, and what you see here and you see it, you know, clearly are these high amplitude, low frequency waves. So this is your brain truly asleep at this point. Um, and yeah, and, and you're sleeping very deeply here. If somebody woke you up during this stage, or if an alarm clock wakes you up during this stage, we can get back to that. You feel so far from being alert and awake. This is when you wake up and you're like totally exhausted. And you're like, what do you want? I'm just, ah. and you feel terrible. Uh, and, and it can be a really sort of uncomfortable experience to go from deep, deep sleep to suddenly being fully awake. Um, and because you're just so far away and there's, there's various chemical changes going on. And that's, that's going to be part of the story too. Our brain, as we go into this sleep, literally changes the neurotransmitters it's using. Um, it starts relying much more heavily on some neurotransmitters than other. And it's kind of like the whole chemical stew that's in your mind is changed. And when you go from that deep sleep to having to be awake, the brain has to transition back um, to that wakeful kind of way of being. And it takes the brain a while to do that. And so we often feel very groggy, very lethargic. Our muscles feel heavy. I'll come back to that. Um, and, uh, and yeah, we just want to go back to bed, you know, when, when, when we're woken up at that point. Um, however, if we allow that to continue for a while, we spend some time in slow wave sleep, then we transition from that to REM sleep. So REM just means rapid eye movement. It was the, you know, before EEG, we could see that during the night, people's eyes would, would move every now and then for a while and then stop. A little while later, they would start moving again. And, and we now know when we look at the EEG of this, that it looks a heck of a lot like the awake and alert. Maybe not quite the frequency, 
uh, maybe a slightly higher amplitude, so a little more on the sleepy side of awake and alert, uh, but, but it's pretty similar to awake and alert. So we have beta waves over here, for example, mixed with sort of some of these thetas every now and then that we see in stage one when you're a little tired. Not only that, if you wake somebody up during REM, they will tell you they were dreaming. Um, that this is, you know, when the eyes are moving, that person is dreaming. And if you wake the person up, they will tell you they were dreaming. And in fact, if, if it makes sense, I'll tell you a ridiculous example, but their eye movements actually match their dreams as, as though their dreams are driving their eyes. So for example, if, if you watch somebody's eyes and you watch for a while and you suddenly see that they're going left and then right and then left and then right and then left and then right in a predictable way, if you wake them up and you say, what were you dreaming about? They might say something like, oh, weirdest thing. I was at this tennis match and I was watching these guys firing fireballs back and forth, but it was like tennis, whatever their dream is, I don't know. But they would tell you they were sitting there watching something go left to right, left to right, which is exactly what their eyes were doing. So, so we see this sort of connection. Okay. You dream for a while. And then after you dream for a while, you scoot back to stage one. So after you dream for a while, or some, some people would say stage two, you know, somewhere around here, you go back to a light sleep and then you go back into deep sleep and then you spend some time in deep sleep and you go back to your dream and then you go back again. So we're constantly going through this cycle. Uh, in fact, this is also from the textbook here. If you kind of look at this overall, you start from being awake and then you go to stage one, stage two, uh, and then you go into the slow wave sleep. Now notice there's quite a bit of this here. Um, and then you come up, maybe stopping at stage two for a little while before you get to the dream state. And then you spend some time in the dream state. Okay, so that would be one whole cycle, right? From being awake here to, to the end of your first dream cycle. And now what do you do? Well, in this case, they have you dropping all the way down to stage two. Right. Sometimes you'll just drop down to stage one, as you see, but you drop down to stage two, rest for a while and then back to slow wave. Uh, and then you do that for a while and you come up, maybe stopping at stage two for a while, but then back to a dream. That's another whole cycle. OK. Uh, and you start it again. Now, what they're depicting here is this might be you have to get up and go have a pee or something. <laughs> when you wake up, it tends to be it tends to be right at the end of a dream cycle like this. This is when it's easiest for you to wake up. You feel relatively okay waking up at that point um, because your mind is already sort of alert and awake. You may have a sort of muscle grogginess. We'll talk about that in a bit. Um, but by and large, you feel okay. And then you go back to bed and you maybe drop down to stage one and then stage two and deep sleep, et cetera, back to another dream. And we do this, you know, in this case, one, two, three, four, five cycles uh, before this person wakes up. Um, again, they can be 45 to 60 minutes. And you see some variability even within these cycles themselves. Some seem to take longer than others, but there is a consistency here um, that's very kind of interesting. Early in the night, we spend a lot of time in the slow wave sleep. And in fact, if we've been sleep deprived at all, this seems to be what we need. Our, our mind goes quickly to that slow wave sleep and gets a lot of it. But once we've had a lot of slow wave sleep, we might in the last few cycles not go there at all. It may just be a sort of lightest, lighter sleep as we hit more towards the morning hours, and we might not have that real deep, deep sleep. On the other hand, the time spent in dreams increases as the night goes on. We spend more and more time dreaming. And in fact, if you ever sleep in on a weekend where you have no alarm clock, you will likely... Um, wake up at the end of a dream and you'll likely feel like you were dreaming a lot just as you woke up. Wow, that was a crazy dream. I have all my craziest dreams on the weekends. No, you don't have your craziest dreams on the weekends. You sleep the longest on the weekends. And so um, you're more likely to wake up after just having a dream. People who say they don't dream um, might be people like this. People that wake up from stage two. If you wake up from stage two, you don't have a dream in your mind. OK, now let's let's add to this an alarm clock. If an alarm clock wakes you up, the alarm clock has no idea what stage of sleep you're in at any given time. It'll wake you up anywhere, you know, wherever you are at that given time. If the alarm clock goes off when you're in a dream, it's not a big deal. You tend to go, OK, good. And you wake up and you're pretty refreshed. Um, it's not even a huge deal if it's stage two or stage one, although it can be a bit annoying. If you're in deep sleep, 
and the alarm clock goes off. Um, that's when it's really, really annoying. Or if someone's yelling at you to get up or whatever it is, that's when it's so hard to get up. It's just, uh, you're not there. Again, all your brain chemicals are kind of wrong at that point in time. Okay, so let's step back for a second. Um, thanks to this EEG machine that allows us to kind of listen to the brain as it's going, we're seeing these sort of regular changes happening over the night. So the brain's doing some cool stuff heck's it doing? What is this about? Um, you know, back to the caveman. Is this important stuff going on here? Or is this not important stuff? And so we've been trying to figure that out. Now, one of the other reasons sleep is a cool thing to think about scientifically is, you know, how do you scientifically study the sleeping mind? It's, it's hard enough to study it when you're awake and you can ask people questions and get them to do things, etc. How do you study the effects of sleep. Uh, and there's some neat, neat techniques I want to, again, showing you how, you know, if you want to be a psychologist, you better be clever. Um, yeah, I won't, I won't pick on the other sciences again. I, I'll avoid it. <laughs> let me, let me talk to you about a few. And this is kind of just a cool, simple study. Sometimes I like the cool, simple study. One of the notions people often give or, or, or think naturally is that sleep is a restorative process it's a, and maybe even a physically restorative process. We wear and tear our bodies and our minds throughout the day. And maybe sleep is about repairing, you know, kind of fixing some of the damage we've done. If it's about repairing, it doesn't necessarily seem to be about physical repair. And so let me tell you about the study and then we'll get to the, the words on the side. Um, there's, there's a cool study done of marathon runners. Uh, so let's say the Boston Marathon. I think it was the Boston Marathon actually. And the cool thing about marathon runners is they come from all over the world. And some of them, depending on how much time they have, you know, come a week before the, the race, some of them come the night before the race or two days before the race. Um, and, and they've all been training really, really hard. And so you, you would assume that those people whose bodies are in the best physical condition would do the best, you know, at, at least related to their own times. That if you compared, you know, my, my time for the marathon, as if I could run a marathon. Anyway, if you compared my time for the marathon, uh, my average time from previous marathons, and you're asking, you know, how well am I going to do in this one? You might think that has to do with how physically strong I am, which could have to do with how much sleep I've been getting lately, if that's what sleep does. Uh, and so they asked all of these runners before the marathon, what is your personal best? What's your average time to do a marathon? And um, how have you been sleeping the last few nights? And so remember that some of these people have come from far away, and so they're suffering jet lag. We'll talk about that in a moment. But they often have, if you travel somewhere far away, you often have trouble sleeping when you're supposed to sleep in that culture. Your brain isn't ready. Uh, and so a lot of these people reported, yeah, I haven't been getting a very good night's sleep. The last couple of sleeps, I'm jet lagged. I'm not at my best, um, etc. And then they looked at how well they did in the race. And what they found is nothing. <laughs> And what I mean by nothing is it did not matter how sleep deprived somebody was. Uh, they, relative to their personal best and their average time, the amount of sleep they'd gotten a few nights before the race did not predict any of that. Um, so it's kind of interesting. And it's led to this view that physically we're not sure that sleep is is. Well, let me say it this way. We think your body is constantly repairing physical damage, awake or asleep. And we don't think sleep per se has any special status in that regard. It's not repairing it especially quickly or especially better. Um, so getting more sleep doesn't mean more physical repair. Does it not have any psychological effect? Well, it does. But it doesn't have a psychological effect as long as the task is relatively habitual and simple. Remember our conscious, unconscious? If you've run a marathon many, many times, then your running of the marathon is largely habit-driven now. Um, you've trained your unconscious mind. And if you're a little sleep-deprived, as long as you don't need to think too much, too deeply, um, then you can do very well. So on relatively habitual tasks, sleep disruption doesn't seem to do much of anything. However, if you're going to play chess or if you're going to do something that's very cognitively demanding like an air traffic controller where you have to keep in 
track multiple things and, and there's a lot of safety on the line uh, or anything like that, then we see sleep depra- deprivation in general having an impact. So not getting enough sleep helps hurts your ability to think consciously, strategically, to concentrate, focus your mind, focus your attention. Um, and those things are important in many, many contexts. Um, and so, you know, that's one thing we've learned about sleep deprivation in general. I'm going to, I'm going to give you more specifics in a moment. Um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Moving forward. Just trying to think how I want to do this. We, we can actually do better than this. So you can disrupt dream sleep specifically so let's not go there yet let me let me just say let me just tell you guys about some experiments um, that are really important so one of them is this with respect to deep sleep and what do we think deep sleep is doing we're, i have to introduce you to this term consolidation we think that sleep is really important to learning and different parts of sleep are different for learning different things Um, Specifically, we think that when you're awake and alert and you go through some learning experience, like watching one of my lectures, um, you're listening, you're getting that information, you're kind of storing it in your mind, it's, it's being put there, but then when you sleep, something gets reorganized, something in your mind about the new information that you've, that you've experienced during that day gets connected to the information you already have in some way that makes the new learning stronger more durable. It is consolidated, we call it, somehow connected to our previous learning and better for it. And so here's an example. So they have they have um, studies where they've asked somebody to learn something. Here, read these paragraphs that, you know, like, like you're reading a chapter, let's say, learn all about this stuff. And then you can, you can, you can do things like the following. You can teach somebody something in the morning and then let, um, say, 10 hours go by and test them on that. Uh, But then you can have one group that during that 10 hours is allowed to sleep and one group that isn't, uh, for example. And what you find typically is the group that sleeps, if you test them on what they learned, they know that they they do, they do better. Okay. Having slept on what they learned. (laughs) That's see, he's sleeping on what he learned. Get it? Anyway, um, but but that notion that when you're allowed to sleep after learning something and then we test you, you do better than if you did not sleep. And and there's uh, some studies in the book where they talk about naps and, and things like that that happen. Okay, that's cool. Um, yeah. That we haven't talked about memory yet, which is why I'm struggling a little bit, because there's a distinction that, that we're going to have to make between learning information which is where deep sleep seems important, this book sort of stuff, versus learning skills. There's different memory systems for these, and it seems like they map onto sleep differently. Specifically, here's another clever manipulation you can do. You can deprive somebody of dreams and not sleep. Hey, actually, let me just step back. I wanna step back. First of all, say, what if you didn't allow anybody to sleep at all? They die. They can die relatively quickly. The textbook quotes a number that's longer um, than I've heard, uh, much longer. I know with animals, because they've done this with animals, of course, um, they've kept them completely sleep deprived, not allowed them to sleep. At some point, their body loses all regulation of temperature, all of their hair falls out, and they die. Why? We don't know. Um, But obviously, sleep is doing something that's important. Uh, If we don't get it, we die. Okay, and so now people started to try to tease apart the parts of sleep. And so they had shorter term, you know, we're not going to let you sleep. And then we notice, hey, okay, if you don't let people sleep, they have trouble learning new information. By the way, if you just if you just do this for a little while, like two or three days of no sleep, you'll start to hallucinate uh, and all sorts of other weird things will happen. But here's something cool you can do. You can dream deprive somebody. Let me go back to here. You can have this person in your lab. They're sleeping. Everything's fine. They get to the here. Their eyes start to move. Random eye movement. You go, hey, hey, wake up, wake up. And they're like, what, what, what? And you're like, oh, nothing. Go back to sleep. And they're like, jerk. And then they go back to sleep. But you know what happens? They don't dream. They start right here. And they go back to sleep. 
and they're sleeping and they're sleeping and they're sleeping and they're sleeping and then they hit here and they start to dream and their eyes move and you go hey, hey, hey wake up they're like what 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 oh nothing go back to sleep mm. <laughs> maybe they go pee <laughs> and they go back to sleep so you can do this all night and you can let them have eight hours of sleep but no dreaming so you can cut dreaming right out and what you see then uh, with the studies that have done this is it has an impact but it has an impact on skill learning so if you do that to somebody as they're learning a skill some sort of motor kind of skill so let me let me just pick playing guitar for example like let's say you teach them let's say bass guitar you teach somebody something about how to play bass guitar um, and then you allow them to sleep but one group you allow to dream the other group you do not uh, what you find is the group that is not allowed to dream has a lot more trouble learning that skill kind of weird what's going on here we don't understand totally um we we really don't that's one of the cool things with psychology we're figuring this stuff out as we go and it's a young science um but we certainly think i, I know i so this is going to be ironic for you i spent a lot of my young days working in fast food restaurants and especially wendy's i worked at wendy's for a while and flipping burgers <laughs> Which is funny, giving them a vegetarian now. But um, when I went to night, when I went to sleep at night, I flipped burgers in my sleep. I'm sure some of you guys work at grocery stores and you're checking people out in your sleep, or you work at, you know, whatever any store and you're stocking shelves, or you know, whatever you do a lot of during the day, you often find yourself doing those actions in in your dreams, and maybe something about that actually enhances your learning of those skills. We don't know. But we know that, that sleep's important. We know that this part of the brain, the hippocampus, remember the amygdala? The amygdala was right there. And then there's this whole fornix structure here. And on the edge of this is the hippocampus. And the hippocampus becomes active at night when we're sleeping. And it seems to be reorganizing information in our minds in some way, so-called consolidation. And this consolidation results in a stronger memory. Of both information and skills if it's a full night's sleep but we know that information is mostly thanks to deep sleep and skills mostly thanks to to REM sleep just some cool stuff we know moving on all right a little bit more about sleep and, and again semi following the textbook here but but taking it my own way to some extent insomnia so the first thing so insomnia is is the inability to sleep in a you know nice clear regular way. I often call insomnia the great multiplier, and and what I mean by that is, if you have any struggle already going on, you have stress, depression, anxiety, schizophrenia, you know virtually anything. If you add to that poor poor sleep, poor nights of sleep, then all of the symptoms are worse, significantly worse. Insomnia makes everything worse um and and it can be driven by our mental state too right so sometimes we have insomnia because we're stressing about something or we feel guilty about something or we're worrying about something etc and so that that mental health state can make us not sleep well which can make the mental health state worse right and this can really kind of drive people crazy and it can lead to an addiction to sleep medications people want to sleep so bad they will start taking pills let me give you the extreme version of this um, if you consider uh touring musicians uh, and especially rock stars back in the day when they used to tour like like all over the world um, and in very compact periods of time playing say 250 shows in a, in a year or something like that um, these people are constantly moving and they're being told things like okay show's over we have so many hours hop in the bus we're going to get from x to y and you have a good six or seven hours when you can sleep on the bus but you just rocked out a show. You just whatever. You and, and now you have seven hours available to you, but is your mind ready to sleep or not? Where are you? Is it morning, evening? Well, it's probably evening wherever you are, but in your mind, it could be a jet lag situation where, where you might be in Japan and it's morning in Japan, but it's not morning in your mind. It doesn't feel like morning to you. So your location is constantly out of sync with your mind and you get limited periods of time to sleep. And very often these people have a lot of trouble getting good sleep and they often turn to drugs of some sort. Um, uh, Self-medicating. So maybe it's just alcohol. Maybe it's just drinking till they pass out literally uh, or various other things or maybe you're michael jackson 
in which case you hire a doctor to anesthetize you when you want to sleep. This is what Michael Jackson was doing over his last tour. He was so worried about being kick-ass when he was on stage um, that he needed to sleep. He knew he needed good sleep to do that, uh, and he couldn't get to sleep when he wanted to. So he hired somebody to treat it like surgery and anesthetize them. That person he hired, like people shouldn't do that. Good doctors would not do that for you. So he found a doctor that would. That was probably not a good doctor. And that good doctor at some, or that not good doctor at some point gave him too much anesthetic and killed him. Um, he died of insomnia, in a sense, uh, Michael Jackson, which is a shame, by the way. Um, not that I'm a huge fan of the music, but I'm a huge fan, or, or, or of all the behaviors of the man, but I'm a huge fan of the musicality of the man. Um, he, he was just a truly gifted musician um, at any rate. So insomnia is critical. I'm going to come back to insomnia in just a moment um, because it's critical for you too. And, and there's ways to prevent it. So I'm going to come back to that in just a moment. But now let's talk about this other um, sort of fun, interesting, fun, interesting thing. Parasomnia. So the one you guys know is sleepwalking. Um, uh, and, and so parasomnias are these weird things where you act like you're awake when you're asleep. And so sleepwalking is your classic example where you may have a little brother or sister. This happens quite a bit to, to younger kids who may get up from their bed and may be walking around the house. And you're like, hey, what's going on? And they're ignoring you and they're acting strange. And then at some point you realize they're still asleep. They're walking around, but they're asleep. And, and what are you usually told? You're told, well, walk them back to bed. Walk them back to bed and tuck them in. Let them go back to sleep. Don't wake them up. Why don't wake them up? Because this tends to happen in deep sleep. Um, and they're not dreaming when they're doing this, by the way. They're just kind of walking through in this weird sort of way, getting enough information from the environment to, to do what they have to do. But they're not awake. Um, and in fact, they're in very deep sleep. And so if you wake them up, remember I told you we all hate to wake up from deep sleep as it is? Well, it's one thing to wake up in, from deep sleep laying in your bed um, with the alarm clock going. It's another thing to wake up from deep sleep outside your house in your pajamas or, or out in the living room or, or somewhere where somebody woke you up. And, and first of all, you're like, what the heck? Why am I awake? Where am I? What's going on? It can be very disorienting to somebody uh, to wake them up uh, while they're sleepwalking. So the cool and funny thing, I know you guys will enjoy some of this, is that it doesn't end at sleepwalking. There is sleep eating, which is fascinating. People wake up um, in the morning and there's like chip bags around the bed or they go to the kitchen and the cupboards have been raided and a bunch of food's been eaten and they're like, who's been eating this food? And then they burp and they go, hmm. That sort of seemed like dill pickle chips. I just burped there. <laughs> but they realize they've been eating the food. They wake up in the middle of the night and they eat. And, well, sorry, I said they wake up in the middle of the night. That's a mistake on my part. They don't wake up. They get up, but they're still asleep. And they eat while they're still asleep. Um, there is sexomnia. Google it. Sexomnia. People who have sex while they're asleep. Uh, the funny example <laughs> that, that always stands in my mind is this this woman who apparently um, had to have this sort of awkward conversation with her husband at some point where she said something like, and this is in one of the papers, you know, every now and then in, in the middle of the night when we have sex, you're, you're like this wild guy and, and whatever. And, and it's really kind of fun and cool. And then, and then other times we have sex and, and you're not like that. You're, you're a lot more calm and gentle and, and that's nice, but I, but I kind of like that wild man. And, and the guy responds back with, what are you talking about? What wild man? <laughs> he is asleep during those sessions and doesn't even know um, that that had happened. Uh, so that's kind of crazy. Now, let's take it to another level of crazy. And you can Google this. I should I should show you. I should have Googled this for you. Um, but um, you, can, you can check it out. Um, if you Google, uh, what would it be? Probably parasomnia. Toronto murder. You will probably find this. You'll find a number of. Um, there, there are people who have committed sexual assaults and committed murders and who have claimed that they were asleep at the time. Um, they thought they were in bed, but they've driven across town to kill like uh, a spouse or I think in one case the parents of a spouse 
uh, ex-spouse perhaps, and they came all the way back, horrible murder, left left clues all the way along, and, and the police come, follow the clues right to the culprit and say, hey, where were you last night? And they say, I was right here in bed. And they say, well, there's all this evidence that suggests you went across town, killed somebody and came back. And and they say, I don't know. I don't, I don't, yeah. Uh, so it turns out people who have these also have some characteristic patterns in their EEG signals. And you can look, you can, if somebody says, I must have been sleepwalking, I must have been whatever, you can look at their patterns during sleep and you can detect whether they suffer from parasomnias. And in one case, at least, this person who murdered somebody um, was let off because they suffered from parasomnia. Somebody else who sexually abused somebody in their sleep um, was found not guilty because they suffer from parasomnias. So there, check that out with your Googling distraction. <laughs> Keep you going a little bit. Now, I want to connect something with these parasomnias to go back to the, to the, to the dream stuff, or, or to go back to the cycles, the stages. So let me actually physically lack stages. There's part of the story I haven't told you yet, which is this. Somewhere between the end of slow wave sleep and the beginning of REM, um, our brain releases a chemical that paralyzes our muscles. And it does that for good reason. Uh, in fact, as the textbook says, for some people, this doesn't work. And if it doesn't work, those people act out their dreams. They flail and the hands are going around, legs are going around, whatever they're dreaming, their body is doing. Um, and, and you don't want to be in bed with one of these people because they will beat the crap out of you while they're sleeping with you. Um, they, they just are acting out their dreams. And the claim is we all would do that, except our brain paralyzes us just before we dream. And that allows us to have these dreams with very minimal inter interaction. This is another reason why, by the way, if you're woken up at that stage, especially where that paralysis is starting to kick in, that's when you feel so heavy, your muscles feel heavy, you literally are a little bit paralyzed. And kind of being able to kind of get up um, is, is extremely difficult for you uh, because that's released. Uh, that's also why, by the way, many dreams include a feeling like there's a weight on your chest or you're trying to get up and you can't get up or you're trying to run but you run so slow. All of this is your mind being a little bit aware that you're paralyzed, that, that, that your body is paralyzed and, and this information kind of sneaks its way into your dreams in weird ways. And so what's going on here? Is there something sort of, these people are in deep sleep but their bodies are not paralyzed and they're not really dreaming, but they're kind of experiencing some things and their body is up and moving around and, and, and doing things, okay? And so this is, um, it's linked to this improper paralysis that normally happens to all of us. By the way, this paralysis can also lead to the weird feeling some of us have when we wake up and we wake up from our dream, but the paralysis is still there. And so for a moment, we feel like we can't move. I don't know if this has happened to you. It happened to me once. Uh, it's creepy. It's freaky. It's like you're just, uh, like your mind's awake, but your body's not. It's sort of stuck there. And then slowly your body will kind of, you know, become unparalyzed. Freaky kind of feeling. Um, yeah. Okay, cool. So there's the parasomnias. All right. So now I just want to very quickly talk to you about what you can do about your sleep. Because if there's one thing, if you, wanted, if you wanted to know what's one thing I could do to maximize my performance as a student and to deal with COVID, to keep my mental health strong, the one thing you could do is sleep better. How do you sleep better? I'm not going to suggest you get a pet if you don't already have one. <laughs> I'm using this pet one to get to something. But, but it's true. We know that uh, owning a pet can help with mental health and sleep. Now, this just says this. I'm going to come back to this. Pet owners are better at handling stress and tend to experience fewer feelings of depression and anxiety than people without pets. This has two positive consequences for sleep. They're kind of suggesting, this is correlational again. They're suggesting that, hey, when you have a pet, you don't have this mental disorder stuff and that helps your sleep. I'm going to suggest that when you have a pet, that helps your sleep, which reduces your issue of having uh, mental disorder. So I'm going to turn the causality the other way, that is sleep and good sleep that's causing good mental health. 
not vice versa. But at any rate, here are two things that are true, that if you do have uh, lower levels of stress, stress releases cortisol, cortisol can impact your ability to sleep. So if you are experiencing less stress, um, you will be able to sleep better in general, which is one reason why we want to deal with stress during COVID. Um, depression specifically affects the parts of the brain that regulate sleep. So combating depression promotes better sleep and spending time with pets can help prevent or reduce symptoms of depression. It's really an interactive thing, and this is why we have a sort of correlational side. So they're really saying that the lower mental disorders helps you sleep. But I'm going to tell you that helping, but getting good sleep is going to help you the other way uh, as well. Um, notice this too. Exercise can have a, a similar significant impact on sleep wellness. It promotes deep sleep, mental relaxation, although the exact relationship is still being researched. Um, pet owners get more exercise, especially dog owners who do 200 minutes of activity per week than average. More 200 more minutes of activity per week than average. Okay, so that's, you know, a good five hours, uh, four hours, four, three hours, three and a half hours, <laughs> more sleep. Um, okay, this is one take on it. I want to tell you um, why I think some of this is true. And, and this is the real story to you. There is this thing called our circadian rhythms. And the textbook will talk about this a little bit. As we go through the day, our body and mind synchronize with our environment. Um, and they do it mostly through sources of light, so-called zeitgeibers, but also through our morning routines and stuff, and our, and our evening routines, our going-to-bed routines, and in fact, our whole through-the-day routines. They kind of synchronize us. And if we're nicely synchronized, then our bodies go through very regular um, cycles during the day. Um, we get insulin being secreted at around the time we're eating our breakfast um, to kind of help with the digestion and combat the, the sugar. We get elevated testosterone around 9 when we're going to start to take on the world. We start to feel our most alert at about 10, um, and then we kind of um, keep that for a while, and etc. We can go all the way through. We see body peak in body temperature around 7 p.m. I want to get more around here. Around 9 p.m., melatonin secretion begins. Melatonin is part of the of triggering that sleep mental state. Uh, I told you the chemicals in the brain change. That's sort of triggering some of that. And so then we go to sleep somewhere around here. We have our deepest sleep around 2 a.m., etc. And then as we get around 6 a.m., cortisol secretion begins, and that starts to wake us up again. So here's the point. If we do this, if we wake up at the same time every day and go to bed at the same time every day, and eat our meals at the same time and every day and do as much as we can in a regular structured way, then we really get synchronized well with our environment. And what that means is when we get to the later hours, around nine or 10, our brain is secreting the stuff it should to help us sleep and we have a much easier time going to sleep. If instead, and this is something that can happen now while we're all doing e-learning during COVID. If you get up at different times, different days, go to bed at different times, different days, your brain and body are going to have a lot of trouble synchronizing with, with the external environment. Um, you are not being consistent. And so your brain and body will not be consistent either in terms of releasing you know, the melatonin, for example, that you need to sleep well just before you go to bed. Uh, it might release it at a time when you want to do something and now you feel tired when you're supposed to be studying. And then when you go to bed, you're not tired anymore um, because you missed it. You kind of missed that period when, you're, when your brain and mind were ready to go to sleep. Uh, and so the more, the more consistent you can make your day in terms of what you do when, the more synchronized your body will become with your day, the easier it'll be for you to fall asleep, the more alert you'll be when you wake up, and the more alert you'll be at the times you want to be alert during the day. Um, and so I highly recommend, you know, A, the best thing you can be doing right now is, is getting good sleep. And B, the best way to get good sleep is to have a, a real structured daily routine. So I tie this all to the pets because this is my analogy to stick in your mind. If any of you know anyone that owns a dog, you know how synchronized they are. Um, the dogs want to go for a walk at a certain time. In the morning, they want to go for a walk in the afternoon. They want their food at certain times and they will bug you. They will sit and stare at you and say, it is time for my treat. Thank you, my nine o'clock treat now. 
um, they are very synchronized and they push their owners to be synchronized as well. So in my opinion, the reason dog owners, and there's research to support this, the reason dog owners are generally happier and sleep better and all these things is because they live by a stricter schedule, a schedule that's enforced by their dogs. Um, and their dogs push them to this routine way of living. It's a way that for anybody, dog or no dog, if you can get yourself into that routine, you will have a, a better time in general. You will be better ready to face um, challenges to your mental health. You will be better able to learn. You will be better able to sleep and you will get better night's sleep. And that will prepare you just about for everything. Okay, so. I'm going to come back and talk about dreams, but I just wanted to give you, you know, that take on, on sleep, which largely overlaps with the textbook, just some of my own little twists there. Um, but mostly I want you to really think about this. This is the best thing you can be doing right now. Um, get yourself synchronized, wake up at the same time every night, every morning. Or whatever you want to do um, go to bed at the same time every night and if you do that you will feel your physical and and intellectual best your physical and your intellectual will be together as they should be um, and so i wanted you to leave with that advice okay cool see you next lecture bye, -bye.